Hello, and welcome to Justice Saturday. This is Jan Phillips. A couple of Saturdays ago, Reverend Linda Smith, the leader of First UU's Just Justice Action Ministry team, gave you an overview of JAM and its various focus groups. I am the facilitator of the Racial Justice and Immigration JAM focus group. This week, I'm going to be talking about racial justice. I'm going to start with a brief history lesson and then go on to talk about what RJI does and how you can engage. Now is a time of reckoning for racial justice and equality for pure persons of color in this country. The murder of George Floyd on Memorial Day ignited protests in response to the injustice that was clearly in front of us. The hard truth is that racial justice is embedded in our society. One way to look at this is to frame it in terms of the four pillars of first slavery, white supremacy, and systemic oppression. These four pillars are government, education, including colleges and universities, the church, and the economy. Today, I'm going to talk about the economic impact of racial injustice. I have leaned heavily upon an article written by Nicole Hannah Jones and published in the June 28th issue of the New York Times Magazine. Let's start with a definition of wealth. Wealth is the value of assets minus debts, or stated another way, it is what is owned minus what is owed. And we're not talking about income. What we're talking about is a concept called wealth. Today, the average black family with children has one penny for every dollar of wealth that the average white family with children holds. That is one penny in comparison with a dollar. And this helps to explain why black families were harder hit during the 2008 recession and why black families are being hit harder than white families during the current COVID-19 pandemic and its resulting economic mess. Without a reserve, people are more vulnerable to economic downturns. This difference in wealth is the result of generations of oppression and inequality. And wealth often means land and home ownership. The wealth of white people in this country was originally built on the backs of enslaved people in the South. Their labor and lives were taken to enrich the planters producing goods that were either exported or sent north to be turned into other goods that were then sold for an additional profit. And the enslaved people reaped no personal financial benefit from their labors. Let's review some governmental policies that have contributed since that time to economic injustice. At the end of the Civil War under Reconstruction for a few months period of time, some formerly enslaved people in Georgia and South Carolina were given a small tract of land, what we read about in our history books as 40 acres and a mule. After the assassination of President Abraham Lincoln, his successor, Andrew Johnson, reneged on this deal and returned the land to the planters, leaving people, again, homeless and without a means to support themselves. At the time of the Civil War, the value of enslaved people added up more to more than all of the nation's railroads and factories combined. But the formerly enslaved people received nothing from the all that had been built from their labors. The Homestead Act of 1862, a federal policy, gave away 246 million acres of land in the West in 160 acre tracts. Very little of this land, less than 10%, was made available to Black families. And today, approximately 46 million American adults, about 20% of the adult population, are people descended from those original homesteaders. The Social Security Act of 1935 provided a safety net for millions of workers providing for income and security in retirement. Specifically excluded from Social Security, however, were domestic and agricultural workers 
most of whom were non-white. These low wage workers were again by public policy put at a disadvantage. The Wagner Act of 1935, which granted unions rights and collective bargaining is another example of public policy which favored white Americans. By allowing unions to exclude non-white people, it gave preference to higher earning jobs to white people. The Fair Housing Act that is credited with creating today's middle class was racist in its implementation. The end result of redlining was more that more than 98% of the $120 billion in federally backed mortgage loans between 1934 and 1962 went to white people. I quote from the article, in other words, while black Americans were being systematically, generationally deprived of the ability to build wealth while also being robbed of the little they had managed to gain, white Americans were not only free to earn money and accumulate wealth with, with exclusive access to the best job schools, best credit terms, but they were also getting substantial government help in doing so. The author goes on to say that since governmental policy can be blamed for these significant levels of wealth disparity, governmental policy can also be used to repair it. And I quote again, if black lives are to truly matter in America, this nation must move beyond its slogans and symbolism. Citizens don't inherit just the glory of their nation, but its wrongs too. Mm -hmm. A truly great country does not ignore or excuse its sins. It confronts them and then works to make them right. If we are to be redeemed, if we are to live up to this magnificent ideals upon which we were founded, we must do what is just. It is time for this country to pay its debt. It is time for reparations. One of the chants at Black Lives Matter rallies has been no justice, no peace. And as you use, we know this, and the time for action is now. First you use RJI focus group is engaged in important work around racial equality. This year we have hosted three standing on the side of love rallies in Clintonville and worked on an event that, that supporters, supported speakers and protesters. In addition, First UU folks are collecting items that, need, that are needed to support the pro protesters who continue to stand for racial justice at protest downtown. First UU is now a collection site for these items and see the email with this video for a list of items that are needed. Here are some other ideas to help you engage in this important work. First, vote and vote for candidates who will work for what you value. Make a plan now for voting in November. I will be voting by absentee ballot and dropping off my ballot at the Board of Elections. Secondly, learn, read and engage. The email with this video provides some possible resources and you can also take part in First You Use Monday Night Conversations About Race, facilitated by Reverend Marion Stewart and Lisa Brandt. Third, join our RJI group, Jam group. And fourth, you can contribute items to support the local Black Lives Matter press protesters. Thank you for listening. Mask up and stay well. And I hope to be able to see you in person soon.